Last week of Revelation today. So we're in the very, we're in the very end. The end of the end. It's the last, we're going to get the last verses of the entire Bible today. The last verses written probably in the Bible. We're going to read them today. Last verses certainly uh, as they are laid out in your Bible today. Um, we've had almost three months now of going through the letter of revealing Jesus. And it has been, hopefully for you, it has certainly been for me, very encouraging, very challenging, paradigm shifting, because the way that in our pop culture, the way our culture generally, and the way that many um, more famous preachers in our day preach Revelation, I would say is different to how Revelation is offered to us in Scripture, uh, how it's meant to be read. And so uh, we've looked at a bunch of those things, and today we're going to see the, the kind of the culmination of all of these things. In fact, today we're, we are past all of the visions. We're past all of the prophecies. So today is a dialogue between John and us and John and an angel, and even Jesus through the angel to John and Jesus through the angel to us. <clears throat> so the prophecies have been laid down. The visions have been made visible, and now we're kind of getting the, the final greetings, the wrap-up of this letter. So I'm going to read it, we're going to get stuck into it, and see what God would have for us. This is, this is Revelation 22, verses 6 to 21. Then he said to me, it's the angel from last week, one of the seven that poured out the bowls. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the word, the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, if you're reading along at home or in your book, you might see some of these letters are in red, denoting Jesus is saying them. Some of these letters are in black, denoting the angel is saying them. And so it's actually important which is which. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had shown them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you, your brothers, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Then he said to me, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. Let the unrighteous go on in unrighteousness. Let the filthy still be filthy. Let the righteous go on, in un go on in righteousness. Let the holy still be holy. Look, I'm coming soon. I've heard this three times now, so it must be important, right? Look, I'm coming soon, and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Both the spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires, take the water of life freely. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and of the holy city, which are written about in this book. He who testifies about these things says, yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen. Let's pray together and we'll see what God would have for us. So, Father, I want to firstly thank you for this book, this letter. Thank you for the challenge and the encouragement it's been to us already. And we're asking again, like every week, that you would open our eyes to see the truth of the things you're revealing to us in these words. We don't want to be ignorant. We don't want to be naive. We don't want to be like children in that ignorance of the things you would reveal to us. 
but we want to be mature. We want to be like Jesus and have his, have his mind. And so help us today, please, Lord, to have understanding and then to put into practice the things we've seen and to take claim of the promises that we'll be blessed if we do so. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we've reached the end, but what we've really reached is the new beginning. So when you hear both in terms of the, the kind of zoomed out macro view of Scripture and macro view of the timeline of history, we have reached not the end, but we've reached the new beginning. And also, as we're reading just Revelation, we've also reached the new beginning. So in, in as much as it is the final words, it's not the end of the end. It's actually the end or, or the beginning of the new beginning or the end of the current age and the beginning of the age that's to come. And so, so we see that as we see all of history, we see that as we see just Scripture, and we see that as we see even Revelation. So as I was reading that, you might have heard a bunch of things that you think, oh, I remember all of those things from back in chapter 1. Just like in chapter 1, John identifies himself, he does that in the beginning, and now he does it again. It's like, a, it's like his book ending all of these prophecies. Jesus is identified in the beginning and he's identified again. Jesus is called the Alpha and the, the Omega in chapter 1. And again, he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega. This is the title that Yahweh claims for himself back in the Old Testament. And just like you know, in Isaiah, we hear that echoed in Jesus claiming of himself, the God of the Old Testament, that's the God who's speaking now, me, Jesus. Blessing is promised in the opening verses of Revelation for those who speak the words, who read these words, for those who hear the words, and for those who do the words. And now at the end, again, blessing is promised for those who hear the words and do the words, assuming it's already been read now. We have this angel messenger, had an angel messenger at the beginning, angel messenger at the end. The purpose of the book is explained in the beginning, purpose of the book is explained at the end. And then Jesus at the beginning says, all of these things are soon to take place. <clears throat> and then four times in the final greetings, Jesus reminds us, I'm coming soon. It's happening soon. These things are soon to take place. I am coming soon. And so we see at the very beginning is the same as the end because it's not the end. It's the beginning of the new, the beginning of what is to come. Everything that's been promised, the culmination of everything. What we're seeing is a, we saw this last week and the week before, a wedding. And it's interesting, if you've been married or you've been a part of a wedding or you know people who've been married, uh, a lot of, in the year or especially months and especially weeks and days in the lead up to the wedding, there is a lot of effort and energy and money and time and focus put in on the wedding. And, and rightly so, it's a big celebration. Uh, but the, the wedding, once the wedding's done, is actually just the beginning of an entirely new way of life. Things don't finish at the wedding. We're going to put in all the effort and energy on just the day. We're putting in all the effort and energy on the life that comes after the wedding. And similarly, as we see the end of Revelation, we're seeing all the effort and energy putting into the climax and culmination of this age, finishing in a wedding, which is just the beginning of the marriage in the new heaven and the new earth. Jesus is speaking through a messenger. So the, the messenger says everything. This angel is saying everything. Sometimes he's speaking on his own behalf. Like when he says, whoa, don't worship me. And sometimes he's speaking, he's just directly quoting Jesus, speaking as if it's Jesus speaking through him, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And even John here mistakes the messenger for the message. <clears throat> I mean, you think about who John is. If this is John the Apostle writing, a guy, the guy who was kind of like Jesus' adoptive little brother, the way I think about it is he's the guy that Jesus would have been like given the noogies. He's the guy at the cross who's saying, John, my mom is now your mom. Mom, John is now your son. Like he's going to look after you like I would have if I was going to stay around in the same capacity. John, like the little brother of Jesus, the one whom Jesus loved, the one who lived the longest on the earth after Jesus rose again and, and uh, went to be with the Father. The one who had been faithful to Jesus the whole time. 
the one who was, I guess, honoured, privileged to be given these visions, these prophecies. And even John bows down and worships someone who's not Jesus. The angel rebukes John. You can almost hear the panic in the words. Whoa, don't do that. I'm just like you. I'm just like your brothers, the prophets. I'm just like everyone who belongs to the Lamb. The angel is saying, I'm just like all you guys. Don't worship me, worship God. But we are very prone to doing this as well. We're very prone. We have our heroes. We have our our favourite preachers who we almost even venerate. We have whole denominations of the church who literally venerate and worship humans, like fellow servants, just like us. And the kind of the echoes of this to us is don't be impressed by messengers in a way that leads to worshipping the messengers. No matter how amazing they are, no matter even how much like this angel had helped John understand the times, understand the future, understand more of who Jesus is, understand more of who he is. Even people who help you to understand, we, we never want to worship people, ever. We don't mess, worship the messengers, we worship the one who sits on the throne. The message, the word is the one we worship. We are very prone to do this. We do this with our even politicians. We do this with preachers. Some people do this with rappers slash shoe moguls. And if the last, just one year, if we even just take this slice of time and we've seen the, the high profile people who before we might have said, wow, what a hero of the faith. I love this person. No, that, I can't believe that negative thing about that person because they are so high and above me that we, we are kind of putting them in the place of mediator rather than Jesus. And we see them fall and then we keep worshipping them. Uh, I think that uh, some high-profile Christians who fall uh, God, God allows that for many reasons, and one of those is so that we would again remind ourselves not to worship the messengers. We don't worship people. We can follow their example, absolutely. We don't worship them. And it goes on, it says, blessed is the one who keeps the word of the prophecies of this book. Blessed. We've seen this actually throughout Revelation. So right in the very beginning, see so it four times in the end, be Blessed. There's blessing in doing this. This is another one of the reasons that we know the letter of Revealing Jesus is not just an abstract book about purely future events. It's not just about the, these final, final couple of years giving a chronological timeline of future events. It's about the reality of the world today because it's saying there is blessing for you today. It's not just blessing for some future people, blessing for us and every Christian who has lived since these words were written, since the visions were given. There's blessing for putting the words of these prophecies into action. We misunderstand the meaning and miss the blessing of the prophecies of this book if they're just for some future event. No, it's for us to keep the book. It's for us to keep the words. So everything we've learned in the last three months, everything we've learned from the letters to the, from the letter to the seven churches, everything we learn about how the deceiver and the counterfeit trinity and their agents are at work in the world today through deception and distraction and death, everything we've learned about heaven and the glory of God as it currently is, everything we've learned about the new heavens and the new earth that are going to come, everything we've learned about suffering and persevering and faithfulness to Jesus, everything we've learned about our new clothes, everything we've learned about our robes, everything we've learned about our being sealed in the Holy Spirit, everything we've learned about being saved for eternity with Jesus, everything we've learned about God calling the nations to repentance, everything we've learned about Jesus coming soon, everything we've learned about the city of Babylon, the city leading to destruction, and everything we've learned about the new city leading to eternal life, Jerusalem, everything we've learned 
about though, the future for those who are in Christ and everything we've learned about the future for those who reject him. We are blessed today when we keep those things. The letter of revealing Jesus is for us today, not uniquely. It's been for every Christian for the last 2,000-ish years. And it's blessing for us when we keep it. There is a kind of false humility that some Christians have, a false piety, where we say, <clears throat> well, there's blessings promised for us, but no, no, I don't, I don't need those. I don't need the blessing. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to suffer for Jesus over here. And the greater my suffering, the less I enjoy life, the more, the more future blessing I'll get. Or the more it costs me now, the more I hate it. Obviously, the more it is the right thing for me to do. That's not how it works. Four times just in this chapter, we are reminded from the angel speaking on behalf of Jesus, you are blessed when you keep the words of his promises. God, God rewards those who love him who are obedient to him and who are faithful to him. And those rewards don't necessarily look like the material rewards that the city of dust, Babylon, rewards its adherents with. But these are blessings. These are promises of blessings to be pursued and to receive and to enjoy. God wants us to be blessed. We need to do work on that word blessed so we separate it from the way that the city of dust calls people blessed, which looks like material health, material wealth, comfort and ease. There's blessing for us. The Old Testament prophet Daniel, he was told similar prophecies, similar visions of similar things, like about how the world works. Daniel is told, seal up those prophecies. They're not for, you. They're not for now. Seal up those prophecies. Seal up the, word, the words of this revealing until the very end or until the end. John is told to tell people. He says, don't seal up these prophecies. Daniel, hundreds of years earlier, seal up the prophecies. John, don't seal up these prophecies. They're for people for now. Daniel's told, seal up the prophecies till the end. John is told, this is the end. Don't seal these prophecies. Again, it's not primarily for some future group of people or event or uniquely us as living in the final finality of the end times. We have been in the end times for almost 2,000 years. Yes, we are in the end times, but not uniquely now. These words are for every Christian. These blessings are for every Christian that has ever lived. And for every Christian that ever will live if the Lord keeps waiting for more to be brought into his family. And so we need to encourage each other in these things, challenge one another in these things, to keep the prophecies in the letter of revealing Jesus. Because there's blessing for us in them. And warnings. And blessing. And why? He, he tells us why. He says, because the time is near. It's been near for, again, 1900, 1900 years, say. Be near. He says, let the unrighteous go into unrighteousness, let the filthy still be filthy, let the righteous go on in righteousness, let the holy still be holy. Again, these are echoes of Daniel and Ezekiel, just like we've seen throughout the letter of revealing Jesus. There's a recapitulation and a culmination, even a consummation of all the prophecies, all the foreshadowing that was coming from before. In the end of Daniel's prophecies, he's told, go about your way. With the prophecies sealed up, he's told, go about your way the many will be purified, cleansed, and refined, but the wicked will lack wickedly, and they won't understand. And then again, Daniel's told to go about his way until he stands to receive his inheritance at the end of days. And this is John, or even Jesus, through John, echoing, recapitulating these words from Daniel, saying, hey, some people are not going to listen. Some people won't hear. They may hear, but they won't hear, if you get what I mean. 
They'll continue on in wickedness. They'll continue on in unrighteousness. They'll continue to wear their filthy rags. They'll refuse the pure white robes of righteousness that Jesus is offering them. <clears throat> and the call to us is the same. The time is near. Evil people will keep doing evil. Don't get distracted. You be righteous. You be holy. And in the end, the, the unrighteous will go to judgment dressed in the filthy rags of unrighteousness and the, those clothed in righteousness will be found holy and set apart. There's more on this in a minute. But he, then the next he goes on and says, there are those inside the city and there are those outside the city. Those inside are those saved by God, those clothed in righteousness, those who have their robes washed is what the angel says. This is just an echo from Revelation 7 where it says, uh, there's a great multitude who come out of the great tribulation, so the last 2,000 years, and until Jesus returns, who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. This is what it says. One of the elders asked me, who are these people in white robes? And where do they come from? I said to him, so you know. Then he told me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. The one seated on the throne will shelter them. They will no longer hunger. They will no longer, no longer thirst. The sun will no longer strike them, nor will any scorching heat. For the lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of the waters of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now you say, oh, we just heard that last week about the new Jerusalem, about the new city. Yes. Yes. Remember, all this apocalyptic or revealing or unveiling language are signs that point us to significance. So how is it that someone washes clothing in blood, which is red, and it comes out pure white? Because it's a sign that points to significance. Will we literally be wearing robes? Perhaps. That's not what's important. What's important is we are clothed, encapsulated. We are totally surrounded by the righteousness of Jesus. We are wearing Christ's righteousness, not our own. What are your robes? Revelation tells us they are our righteous acts. And those who are in the city are those who have the blood of Jesus covering all of our acts. We're not standing in our own righteousness. We are standing in Christ's righteousness, all of his perfection credited to us. Those outside the city, these are the ones who don't belong to Jesus. They're the ones who haven't washed their robes. Let the filthy keep being filthy, let the unrighteous keep going on in unrighteousness. These are the ones who come to the gate Again, figurative, symbolic gate. And I say, check out my robe. Look at everything that I've done. Look how good I am. I have climbed the moral ladder. Let me in. And whether it's at that moment or, or whenever, uh, they'll see and everyone will see. Uh, they're not dressed... In pure, righteous, in pure white righteousness. They're dressed in filthy rags. They don't qualify because they're coming with their own works. Those that are not washing the blood, covered in Jesus' perfect righteousness, are worn by those found outside the city. And outside the city, again, this is figurative, symbolic language, <clears throat> Sometimes, especially in like movies uh, or pop culture, you hear about hell spoken about as some sort of party. Well, outside the city, inside the city, that's all the goody two-shoes, right? That's the boring part. Outside the city, that's where we just party all the time. That's where I see all my mates. That's where, you know, we just ha it's, it's constantly do whatever you want to do, no rules, no one telling me what to do, et cetera, et cetera. That's not how outside the city is spoken about in the letter of Revealing Jesus. It is dust. And we 
heard about the city of Babylon, which is utterly destroyed. There is no party going on there. There are no weddings. There are no musical instruments. Nothing's happening there. They're the ones who have, like even death and the place of death, have been thrown to lake of fire and... But we're reminded here in Revelation, you don't have to be among them. It says the Spirit calls to you, come. The Spirit says, come. And the bride, which is the new city, which is the church, calls to you, come. This is where we as a community, as a family, have a prophetic obligation to live a, a, a life that echoes to the world, come. And when people look in on us, they see a foreshadowing of the new city. They see the bearing of burdens. They see Christ's righteousness at work among us. They see us applying the gospel in our lives. They see the love of Jesus kind of made tangible among us. And that itself is a prophetic witness to the world, saying, come. We're not awesome because we have climbed the moral threshold. We're not awesome because we've got our lives figured out. We're not awesome because we don't struggle with physical health or because we don't struggle with mental health or because we don't struggle with fractured relationships or we don't struggle financially or we don't struggle vocationally or we don't struggle relationally. No, no, we... We are only a community. We are only a family because of the finished work of Jesus. Because he has given us new clothes. Because we have dipped our clothes, washed them in the blood of Jesus. We we claim only Christ. And the ones who hear respond, come. And all the thirsty ones come and take the water of life freely. I love this passage of scripture. It goes over Isaiah in there, Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who is thirsty, come to the water. And you without silver, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. Say, hey, that, you're not coming with your own credibility, with your own authority, with your own good works, with your life figured out. You're not coming with your own, you know, whatever it is that you've accomplished or store it up for yourselves and say, I deserve this. Here, let me exchange my righteousness or my money for the water. We come empty-handed and drink with our price. Echoes of Jesus, John 7. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Spirit says, come. We as a prophetic community say, come. The one who hears says, come and anyone who's thirsty can come and drink. If you are, if you have an unquenched thirst, there's something in life you don't have that you want, you can come and find your fulfillment in Jesus. In fact, he's the only, he is the only water that will satisfy your thirst because you've been created to thirst for the water only he can give. And he gives it to you freely lavishly. He will satisfy your thirst. He will give you water that never runs out. He says, come, come to him. John goes on and says, we can't take away from the words of the prophecies in the letter of revealing Jesus and we can't add to it. So often people take this as a catch-all for all of scripture and I would say that's that is true, uh, but specifically these words about, are about the prophecies in the letter of revealing Jesus. So it says, man, we better not take away from these because anyone who takes away from the prophecies, these things that have been revealed from Jesus, about Jesus, if you take away from them, God will take away your access to the tree of life and the, and the, the river of life. And if you add to them the things you say, man, I don't, I don't like this, or it would be better if, if, if it said this, then God will add to that person the plagues that are promised. So we need to be very careful that we proclaim the prophecies in this book 
the truths of Jesus that have been revealed, we proclaim them boldly but humbly. If there's any reason to not preach through Revelation, this warning is it. But if there's any reason to preach through and, and study Revelation, it is also because of this. We don't want to add to it, but also we don't want to take away from it. We don't want to take away by just omitting it. Remember, we looked at this right at the very beginning. Um, some of the responses to Revelation are to just avoid it. It's too fearful. We're, it's been preached so poorly that instead of producing encouragement and hope, it's produced fear and avoidance. They've fallen into the trap. We don't want to, we don't want to do that. We don't want to fear it. We don't want to avoid it. We want to sober-mindedly receive it, see what's being unveiled, receive it, and then live it, and be blessed. And then finally he says, I'm coming soon. Revelation 22, 20 and 21, he who testifies about these things says, yep, yes, I'm coming soon. And then John adds, amen, come Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen. So he says, I'm coming soon. And so you might say, hang on a second. I thought this revealing happened 1900 years ago, 1950 years ago. And Jesus says, I'm coming soon. And we have people even, so um, we see uh, one of the churches written to is this church in Ephesus where people would, go out and, and literally kind of look to the sky waiting for Jesus' return because he said he's coming soon. And here we are. It seems like Jesus' version of soon is different to our version of soon. How do we reconcile these things? Uh, this word soon, like he has said over and over and over again, uh, we can take to mean quickly or suddenly. I'm coming soon. It's not, again, like we've shown over and over and over again, the letter of revealing Jesus, book of Revelation, is not a linear chronological timeline of events. We're reading it wrong, and we miss the point when we read it like this. He's not saying I'm coming soon as in tomorrow or next week or five years from now or seven years from now. He's saying I'm coming soon as in you're not going to know when I'm coming, which is why over and over and over again he said in this letter and when he was uh, in his earthly ministry, you won't know when I come. I'm coming like a thief. What's the point of the letter? What is he saying? He's saying, be ready. Be ready. Remember what he told all but one of the seven churches. He said, I'm coming soon. I'm coming like a thief. And when I come, if you haven't responded to the, to the warnings, I will take away your lampstand. And, and that's what we've seen. Like the church in Ephesus, we read all about in Acts 19, and we read in Paul's letter to the Ephesian church, and we see them again here, and how they praise and how amazingly they do. And Jesus says, I'm coming soon, and whoo, it's the last we hear of them. He takes away the lampstand. He came suddenly. But he also says, I'm coming soon. If you open the door, I will enter in and I'll eat with you. He says, I'm coming soon. And with that coming soon is the promise of both righteous perfect judgment and righteous, perfect reward. He promises reward in this chapter. He promises reward. He's bringing reward with him. And so there's a sense in which his I'm coming unexpectedly happens even in our time, like with the church in Ephesus where he removes the lampstand, but also in our sense that will be culminated at the very end. He's coming ultimately at the end. And the call to everybody in both circumstances, in both senses, is be ready. Be ready. He's coming suddenly to judge us all. If he judges us according to our own works, to the privation of life. If he judges us according to his works, to eternal life. And so we need to forget about speculating as some do. Forget about asking the question, do current times and events line up with the prophecies? And instead, the call of revelation is to ask ourselves, does my heart line up with Jesus? 
Forget about the speculation about, oh, how's this timeline and, you know, the threat and the, and the whatnot of where's Russia and China and Donald Trump and whatever. That's foolishness. It says, forget about that. It's not a timeline. That's the wrong kind of soon. It's like a thief in the night. Are you ready when he comes? Be ready, be ready. That's what the whole letter's for. Don't miss it. Be ready. How do you know you answer the Spirit when he says come? How do you know you're ready? How do you know you're clothed in righteousness? How do you know you're sealed with the Holy Spirit? Seems like this is the question of Revelation, right? Uh, One encouraging way that you can self-determine or or you can, in community, even preferably in community, with people, with our lives laid open before others, ask the question, is my desire for the next city with Jesus forever? Or is my desire for in the city leading to dust. Do we echo John and say, amen, come Lord Jesus? Or do we say, well, hold on a second, there's so many things I want to do before you come, Lord. There's so many things in this life that I value over and above the things that you're doing. Or so many things that I, I want to do for me or that I love you for your salvation and I mitigate your lordship. I'll take all of the salvation and I will take your lordship under advisement. You can be my advisor, but not my lord. We can analyze our own standing before the Lord. Here's John on a rock in the ocean saying, Amen, come Lord Jesus. Might be easy for him. At the end of his life, lived a long life, Fruitful life. He's suffering now. For him to say, yeah, come Lord Jesus. You might say, that doesn't cost him very much to say that, except that he said that his whole life. But for us, we might have a lot of life left ahead of us. We live in one of the most comfortable, prosperous, peaceful, wealthy countries that has ever existed The city of Babylon was far from John. Again, on a rock in the middle of nowhere. Not enjoying, no chance to enjoy the city that leads to dust. We can't escape the city that leads to dust. That's why we need each other. That's why we need scripture. That's why we need to hear and then live the words of the prophecy so that we don't grow in our affection to the city that leads to dust. But we grow in our affection for the city that is to come and the one who rules and reigns, not just over that city, but even over all of the world today. We are too easily satisfied. It's not that we are not satisfied enough. So we are too easily satisfied. Too easily satisfied with comfort. Too easily satisfied with food too easily satisfied with health, too easily satisfied with wealth. We need to do the work to make sure we are living out, not just hearing, not just reading, but living out the things that we read in in the scripture, especially in this letter. That we long for the day when sin and even death is dealt with, when all things are made new, let's become people who are, not only can our affection not be wrapped up in the city that leads to dust, but we desire greater things than the world can even offer. That's the work we need to be doing. For the day God makes all things new and let us say with our voices, like literally with our words, but also prophetically as a community, let's say to a watching world, come. There's something so much greater than the things that the city that leads to dust can offer. Not only that, abandon your filthy rags that to your material eye look amazing, but to Jesus' eye look filthy and lead to death and destruction and come be clothed in Christ's righteousness. We've heard it. Now let's go and do it and let's be blessed. Father God, I want to thank you for the letters 
uh, the, the words in this letter. Thank you for the promises in it. Thank you for the warnings in it that, Lord, help us in, our, in ourselves as individuals, in our families, and us as your family here at Cedar Light. Help us to embody and live out the things that we've heard. That the grace of the Lord Jesus would be with us, as uh, John writes at the end. And that we would echo, respond to the Spirit and say, come. And then echo out to the world and say, come. Lord, help us to revel in our new robes. Help us have eyes only for the new city and not for the city that leads to dust. Father, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Help us to heap all of our hope in him not just as our Saviour, but as our Lord, because we know his, your ways are better than our ways, are higher than our ways. And so, Father, we submit ourselves to you wholly, fully. We want no hint of the former, no hint of the filthy rags. We want to wash our robes completely in the blood of Jesus so that we'd be washed white as snow. Father, we long for that new day. We say, come, please, would you come? soon. Would you do this in our lifetime? Bring the new heavens and the new earth, the new city, deal with death, deal with sin. And Father, from this day to that day, help us to be effective in our witness, effective in our prophetic living as a community that echoes the the gospel, echoes the beauty of Christ. We'd be in step with your spirit, sealed with your spirit and blessed in our living out the things we've heard, read and will go and do. In the name of Jesus we ask, amen.